okay, so what is your plan? My plan is, is mud. <laughs> what am I going to do now? And so, you know, after, a, you know, a session of tears and prayer, I, I went back to um, the Manoa campus, University of Hawaii Manoa campus course catalog, and I'm scanning all of these, and I'm praying, Lord, give me wisdom, Lord, give me wisdom. James chapter 1, verse 5, right? Anyone lacks wisdom, ask God, and he will give you liberally. So, okay, okay, ask for wisdom, ask for And I'm looking through this catalog of courses and, and, and things that I can graduate in, and I chose marketing. And the Lord, oh, Hi, Uncle Jordan! Thank you for joining us. <laughs> We're gonna mute you right now if you don't mind. <laughs> TJ, can you press the mute on the soundboard or the computer? Praise the Lord. And uh, everybody wanna say hi before we continue? Hi. hi. Okay, the camera's back there. <laughs> Right above me, <laughs> So I'm in college, and I gave my plan over to the Lord, and God took it, and God showed me I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna finish up my my education and graduate and get on with my life because life in university is no life at all. Hallelujah! Gotta get on with it. Gotta live, right? Amen. Amen. So I went with the shortest program. We happened to be marketing. We bought my GPA a full point up. Because it was a lot easier than computers. <laughs> it was a lot easier than all the math. For me, um, God knows how he created me. And he created me with a mind that is just more uh, in tune and suitable for marketing. And, and praise the Lord that I'm a marketer for Jesus and the kingdom of God today. Amen? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord praise. <laughs> and so God knows. He has the plans laid out for you. But the problem is we have to navigate those steps. We have to be willing to, hey, put some plans in the rubbish can. You know, we have to be willing to let go of some things and make the tough decisions and uh, let go of, you know, uh, some dreams. My dream was to, uh, I wanted to work international because I, I wanted to travel. I want, I didn't want to go on a, a, a tour and be a tourist and just see the tourist places. I wanted to live with the people and, and experience uh, living in different cultures. And praise God, he made me a missionary today. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> see, God is like so good yeah. and so many different levels. He knows what he's doing. Even we may not understand it. It says here in uh, Proverbs chapter 16, a man's a man's heart plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. The Lord gives us directions for our steps. But guess who has to make those steps? Right? We have to take those steps. Right? You know, um, nowadays, you, you, anything you buy nowadays has directions. Right? And what's the first direction? Read all directions before uh -huh. using this product. Right? Is it? Is it? God gives us directions. And we, we you know, we gotta look at, you know, we gotta like be all in. We got don't don't start and then halfway through you change your mind. James chapter one, verse five. Right? God if, if you lack wisdom, ask God, He gives you liberally. Verse six, seven, and eight. You know, don't be wishy-washy, don't backtrack, don't turn around, right? A double-minded man is unstable in his ways. So in our journey, we need to keep two things in, in mind. Number one, sometimes God calls us to exchange our plans for his plan in order for us to, in order to accomplish greater things. God wants to accomplish greater things in our lives. And sometimes that means we have to exchange our plans for his. We got to be willing to let it go. And guess what, folks? Secondly, God can make miracles out of your mistakes. I want you to know that today, that God can do miracles out of our mistakes. And so, you know, all those errors I made in my, uh, my computer science classes, all the times I was failing, God turned those around and made a miracle out of it. Today, if you are following your reading assignment, Today, we are in a book of um, this week. You're going to be introduced to 
a boy king named Josiah. And from the book of Chronicles. And so I just kind of want to give you a little background on the book of Chronicles. And um, it's in the, oh, it's towards the first, the end of the first half of your Bible. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, the, it's before Psalms. Okay, so you have Genesis, you have Moses, you have Joshua, you have the judges. And then the people get tired of the judges, so you have the kings. That's how I remember it. Okay. And then um, after Kings comes the book of Chronicles. Uh, because the book of Kings talks about all the kings of Israel, but the book of Chronicles gives you a history of the nation, which includes the kings. So the word uh, the word chronicle, we know it means a factual written account of events that and in the order that they occurred. Okay, and so that's what the books of Chronicles are all about. And as you begin to uh, look at these books, I know they, they look kind of scary, kind of intimidating. They're big books in the Bible. But I just want to encourage you uh, to take the time to read. You know, don't have to don't 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 try to read the whole thing at one time. If you're intimidated by, just take piece by piece. And so even in our um, re, uh, in our reading assignment booklet. They break it down. They break it down so that um, you, so that we don't get intimidated by the whole thing. And so last week we talked about Isaiah. You remember how Isaiah prophesied Babylon coming? Okay. So this week we're today we're gonna kind of highlight some things in Chronicles chapter thirty-four, um, just before the the invasion of Babylon. By the way, I'm gonna be talking about second. Second Chronicles, I'm going to be reading from Second Chronicles chapter 34. The first book of Chronicles actually uh, gives a history from Adam to David. The second book of Chronicles gives a history from King, uh, David, King David's son, Solomon, all the way through the invasion of Babylon and Syria and the return to Jerusalem. And then the next book, oddly enough, after the two books of Chronicles is the book of Ezra, who many scholars believe wrote Chronicles. In fact, many of them believe that all three books were actually one originally. And they, you know, and uh, that had been um, broke, you know, um, separated. But they see, you know, consistency uh, in in the um, in all three books um, and style that they uh, believe that uh, Ezra wrote all three books as um, one unit. So just some interesting background on that. And so this morning, as you get your Bibles ready, uh, we're going to uh, start reading from Isaiah chapter 34, verse 1. We're going to begin with the first verse. Oh, did I say Isaiah? Chronicles. Second Chronicles, chapter 34, verse 1. Did I get it right? Okay. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Wow. How awesome is that? I'm a Chris. How old is AJ? Five. Oh, he's five. Okay, so three more years. Gotta be here. But Josiah was only eight years old when he became king, and he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Hallelujah. And he walked in all the ways of his father, David. Now, David wasn't his father, okay? But they're just referring to David as being a father, spiritual father, okay, King David, because he did things like King David. So he, it says that he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek God, the God of his father David. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the wooden images, and the carved images, and the molded images. They're talking about all pagan religions. Places, pagan places of worship were, are referred to as high places in the New Testament, uh, in the Old Testament. 
And so we see here Josiah just really loving the Lord, a young man who loves the Lord, and you know, for over thirty-one, for over thirty years, you know, he just sought after the Lord, and he really brought reform to the nation that was a pagan nation. Can you believe that? That that Judah was actually a pagan nation, and Judah being the whole region, the the, the whole kingdom, and Jerusalem being the city, and even in Jerusalem during that time. They had pagan worship going on. And here Josiah was busy at work, uh, just um, getting rid of those things, purging the uh, nation of all of these ungodly practices and trying to bring the whole nation back to God. And um, as you, if you skip down and get to verse eight, it says that in the 18th year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the temple, that he sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, Maaseah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. So he got rid of, so Josiah gets rid of all the pagan worship, all the, um, and, and then he starts to rebuild the house of the Lord, rebuild the church, rebuild the, the actual temple. And so it was because, you know, um, they had allowed it to be used for pagan worship, for worship of Baal and sacrificing to all these pagan gods. It says here in verse 9 that when they came to, um, they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, that they delivered money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites who kept the doors had gathered from the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh and Ephraim referring to the tribes of Manasseh the tribe of Ephraim, from all the remnant of Israel, from Judah, from Benjamin, which they had brought back into Jerusalem. So this tells us that there was a treasury, that they had been, um, you know, uh, that, that the, the temple had some funds. And now that they were rebuilding the temple for the Lord, they are bringing all these funds together in order to fund the building project, hallelujah. And so we see here that um, that repairs begin on the temple of the Lord, and as they begin to move in, as they begin to you know destruct and reconstruct, it says in verse fourteen. Now, when they had brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the Lord given to Moses. Can you imagine, you know, the temple being used for all kinds of pagan activities and finally they have a good king that will fund a, a refurbishing, rebuilding, reconstruction project and getting the temple right uh, back with God. And during all of this uh, repairs, doing all of the construction, they find a book that you know, must have just been discarded must have just been lost. I don't know. Was it in a back room that was, you know, that fell, that was demolished, or what? Does it say? It just says that the book of the law was found. The book of the Lord that was given to Moses was found. Verse fifteen says, Then Helkiah answered and said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Helkiah gave the book to Shaphan. And then Shaphan brings the book to uh, King Josiah. And this is what happens in verse 18. Shaphan the scribe told the king saying, Helkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. Thus it happened when the king heard the words of the law that he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Adon, Abaddon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the scribe, and Asaiah, a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and Judah concerning the words of of the book that is found, for a for great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord 
to do according to all that is written in this book. In spite of everything that King Josiah was doing to reform his nation, in spite of tearing down and getting rid of all the pagan worship, all the, the, the false idols, all the, the, the places of what pagan worship, as the scribe began to read the book of the law that was given to Moses, the king, the king begins to realize how short he has fallen on God's plan. As much as he, all of his plan for rebuilding and reforming the nation, it, was, it still was not on track with God's plan. And so we see here that upon realizing this, that the king, it says in verse 19, that he tore his clothes as if, you know, a dead man, as if mourning, realizing the things that God requires. And then realizing the things that they have not, the laws that they have not been following, the consequences that come along with that. And it said, you know, the, 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 the act of tearing his garment is, is a sign of warning. And he tells the leaders to go and inquire of the Lord for me. To go and seek God for me. You know, sometimes we may have the best made plans, right? Ahead of the man makes plans. We have a lot of plans. And we think we have good plans and, you know, we think that, you know, we got it all planned out only to be disappointed when it doesn't work out the way that we plan. You know, there's always the X factor. There's always that, 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 that unknown that gets thrown into the mix, that, that it, it, a wrench in the gear. You know, something small that comes up, just, it can just totally wipe out the plans that I have. I don't know about you, but have you ever had a plan that was wiped out, that totally devastated, that changed the course of your life? Josiah didn't let his mistakes hold him back. How did he move on? It says here that he went to inquire of the Lord. Instead of being, you know, um, frozen up, afraid to make any move, afraid to make any new choices, afraid to make any new plans because, oh, it's not going to turn out anyways. You ever, you know, ever deal with those kind of thinking? Like, I'm done making plans. I'm here to encourage you today. Make plans. Dream dreams. And give them all to the Lord. Amen. Amen. God calls us to exchange his plans for his. And um, in order to, because God wants us to do greater things. And God can make miracles out of mistakes. Don't worry about your mistakes. If you made mistakes in the past, don't worry about it. Let God, give it to God and God will change it into a miracle. He really can. And there's so many um, illustrations in the Bible that we can think of where people thought that they made a mistake, but God turned it and used it for good. Amen? Amen. And we look at the life of Joseph. You know, he made the mistake. We always think, of, oh, the first mistake he made, he shouldn't have told his brothers about the dream. <laughs> but you know what? If he didn't tell his brothers about the dream, he would have never made it to Egypt. He would have never become uh, the, the, the overseer of the wealth, the treasury of Egypt. Did you realize that? If he never told his brother the dream, they would have never left him. They would have never sold him to the slave, uh, as a slave. He would have never ended up at Potiphar's house. He would have never ended up in prison with the king's butler and, and cupbearer. And he would have never um, been there 
to interpret the king's dream and to save the nation of Egypt. And then save his own family when his family came to Egypt looking for food. God can take a mistake and turn it from, from miracles. Hallelujah. So three things to know when you are following God's direction. Read all the instructions before using it. <laughs> okay. No, that's that was mine. These are pastor codes, okay? The Lord directs our steps. The Lord delights in every detail, and the Lord holds out his hand. Psalms chapter 37, 23. You see that? It says that the steps of a good man are ordered or directed by the Lord. So God does direct our steps. God does have directions for you and I to take. That's the first thing we need to know, that if the directions are there now, I can decide whether, you know, I just want to look at the picture and put things together <laughs> by, by the illustration, by just using a diagram, or if I'm really going to read the directions and follow all the directions, you know. Um, sometimes, you know, I, I look at the, 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 the diagrams and I think, oh, I can do this. And halfway through, I'm stuck. And then I start reading directions. And then it, it all turns out in the end, right? Amen. Amen. Praise God. But the steps are there. Should we choose to take it? And God delights. God delights in giving us directions. God delights in every detail. He likes to give uh, detailed directions. You know, he has, there's so many ways that God, uh, first of all, we have his word. That God directs us by his word. Right? His, in Psalms chapter 19, verse uh, 133, the psalmist writes, Guide my steps by your word, and I will not be overcome by evil. And God directs us by circumstances. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, it says that, um, that God opens doors that no one can close. It tells us that God shuts doors that no one can shut. God directs us by wise counsel because he loves directing us. He's like, oh, he's got all these different ways for directing us. You know, wise counsel. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 10 says, pride leads to conflict, but those who take advice are wise. And in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15, it says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listens to others. So God guides us by a wise counsel. And God sometimes also guides us by an inward witness. You know that that you know the peace that people talk about. Oh, I have a peace about that. Okay. So in uh, Proverbs chapter three, verse six, it says, "Listen to God's voice in everything that you do and everywhere that you go. He is the one who will keep you on track." Um, so um, what I do is I take these four things: God's word, circumstances. Counsel, wise counsel, godly counsel, and um, and that inward witness. I take all four of these, and I make sure that the decisions that I make that they they fit in all these four. You know, it's the only you know God's word is the only thing that doesn't change. Circumstances change. People's counsel change. You know, when, when people they 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 hear new ideas, their their counsel might change. And the inward witness, oh my gosh, I told you guys the last time, right? About you know going with your heart, going with your feelings, and bouncing off the wall. The only thing that remains the same that, that I can always count on is God's word. So whenever I get a a, a, a sign. Or, or direction from circumstances, wise counsel, inward witness, I always match it up with God's word. Always match it up with God's word before I move forward. So God directs our steps and he delights in giving the details. He delights in every detail of his uh, direction. And the Lord also upholds us by our hand. It says, for the Lord upholds him with his hands. Sounds so poetic, but you know what? Actually, that all that means is that God holds my hand. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm walking down a road, I just want somebody to hold my hand. Somebody to take my hand and lead me there. And that's what this is saying. That's what Psalms chapter 37, verse 23 is saying. 
that God holds our hand, that we don't walk alone, amen? amen? We never walk alone. God is with us. He will never forsake us. He will never leave us. Yes. Amen. And even, and even if I should make a mistake, even if I should make a mistake, God doesn't turn away from us when we make a mistake. And, and so we shouldn't give up on God. We shouldn't feel like, oh, I blew it, I messed up, and I'm, and that's it. I'm done. No. Endure to the end. Amen? Amen? Endure to the end and let God make miracles out of your mistakes. Hallelujah. Let's, so we're going to finish this passage in um, uh, Second Chronicles chapter 34. And so we left off with Josiah just totally contrite and broken to, uh, and, and uh, horrified, horrified to realize the things that are written in Moses' laws that they have totally missed. And he said,